Um, Mr. Chair, um, I, I'll start this the meeting today. Um, welcome. Um, thank you. Your computer. Thank you. No, you could. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, this morning we're here to hear the, re the results of a preliminary engineer's report. Please note this is preliminary, it is a high level report. Uh, that is what we ordered back a uh, few, about a month or two ago. As you recall, we did go through the, uh, we did hear a petition, and then through that, through that process, you did order the appointment of a water engineer. Scott County contracted with ISG to perform that work and deliver the preliminary findings report at the end of the year county staff. I would like to start with just giving you some baseline statistics for your information on Ditch 10. There's a total of 75 different properties and 4,140 acres that are benefited from this ditch. There are eight properties that are not agricultural. Seven of them are residential. One of them is owned by the DNR. Of the 67 re remaining ag properties, 28% of them are less than 40 acres. There are 34% of them that are 40 to 60 acres in size. 60, 18% are 61 to 80 acres, and the remaining are all over 100 acres. County Ditch 10 is a very active ditch. Uh, you're going to see that by, if you walk around, you've seen some of, the, some of the maps that are out there. There's been a lot of work done on Ditch 10, but you're going to see from the presentation that there's a lot of, of maintenance needs still remaining on that ditch. There are two ditches in Scott County that aren't very active. In fact, one's not active at all. It hasn't been active for at least my 37 years working for Scott County. And one of them has been also named Credit River. <laughs> so drainage ditch four is also Credit River. And there's only a, maybe one or two properties that actually benefit from that ditch. Otherwise it's become very, very urbanized. So those two ditches don't really perform as county ditches as much as the remainder of our ditches. Last Wednesday, Scott County team held a um, public meeting at Belt Plain Public Library along with ISG for all the benefit of the owners. We sent a letter inviting them to come to this public meeting so that it's an <clears throat> informal process. We had maps, there was a presentation done, we had handouts, and then we allowed the folks to do their one-on-one -on -one with ISG and our county staff or a combination of both. 14 people attended last week public meeting. Today you're going to hear the same presentation by ISG. The representatives from ISG, Daryl Pettis and Bailey Griffin are here with us today. They're going to be doing this. In addition, we have staff from the SWCD. Diane Corbo, who is the Ag Program Specialist, specializes in buffer questions, as well as Andy Gorupski, who is the Resource Conservationist who deals with conservation and erosion. Troy Kufal is on, who is the, uh, the SWCD district director, is on with us via Zoom. He will only be in attendance for approximately 45 minutes to an hour, then he has to leave for another meeting. Staff from the county surveyors are, office, are with us as well today. Before I turn this presentation over to um, ISG, I would like to give you just a couple other comments for your consideration as we go through this process. You are the ditch authority. You're the only body that can make the decisions regarding what you're going to hear today. There are items that you need to consider as you hear from ISG and the property owners. The roles of the county drainage ditch keep the drainage system in a state of repair. That includes ensuring the ditch is inspected and that the repairs are done as necessary. Prevent damage. That means remove obstructions, install or replace culverts and or bridges. Prevent unauthorized use. Ensure that property, that all the properties that benefit from the ditch are included, are identified and included as benefited lands. And then the, the last one is ensure that the original benefits or damages represent reasonable present day land values or that the benefited or damaged lands have not changed. They have to, if, if, they, if you find that this has changed, you need to appoint three viewers to do a redetermination of that ditch. <clears throat> you have to consider the interests of the owners. 
both the economic interest and the environmental interest. Now, I'm going to speak, uh, lastly, I'm going to put a little caveat in there. You have a lot of discretion in the extent of the repair, the damage, or the use and benefit within the law. There have been many lawsuits filed. Um, of course, I'm, I'm not, I've read some of them, but uh, we do know that the courts have made various, various determinations based upon what you did as a board in prior years, as well as what you're doing here today. But just remember, you do have some judgment in how much you really feel is necessary. And because you do have some judgment, you're probably going to have a lot of questions, not only about what you maybe what you need to do, but even what is the process as we move forward. So with that, as you know, we brought forward with you right around the, the turn of the year, um, a retainer contract with Rinky Noodle Law Firm. They are they're a law firm that specialize in drainage proceedings and is available to answer the quest any questions that you may have that deal more specifically with your roles and responsibilities, <clears throat> the process, if we need a repair petition under uh, 103E.701, which is a, not what we received from Mr. Jurison. It has another whole caveat to it, which includes bonding. And in this, because of the, the dollars, we're very limited to um, what we can do that has to remain under 175,000. And, and as we go through this process, you're gonna see what those figures are. So we're probably gonna need that petition. On Zoom with us today is John Cole from Rinky Noonan. Um, and so I want to make sure that anything that you, any questions you have from a legal perspective that we really do direct it to him. That's why we do have that law firm on retainer. John, did I miss anything, or is there anything else you want to add before we move on and turn this over to ISG? No, Cindy, and thank you. And just commissioners, Cindy just took a day-long seminar on public drainage and condensed it into just a few minutes. Um, so again, I, I'm here as a resource for you, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have and put some of the things you're going to hear today into context, but I think Cindy did an excellent job summarizing uh, the challenge laid before you and the discretion that you have to exercise in making decisions regarding ditch 10. So with that, Mr. Chair, I think we'll turn it over to ISG if that's your wish, unless you have any further questions. Daryl. Thank you, Cindy. Um, County Board Commissioners, uh, thank you for having us today. I'm Daryl Pettis. I am a senior engineer with ISG. I've been there about five years. I came from the Sewer County for 21 years before that. So I've met a number of you before with our numerous uh, joint ditches with the Sewer and Scott County. So I'd like to have Bailey introduce herself. Hi guys, my name is Bailey Griffin. Um, I'm a graduate engineer with ISG. I've been with ISG about four years and I do a lot of the um, design and modeling and kind of a lot of the back end work that goes into a lot of these studies. At our uh, landowner meeting, uh, Chuck Randall, who's actually our boss, was uh, there. He is in Jackson County this morning for a very similar activity in Jackson County. So Bailey and I are here this morning. So we'd like to thank you for uh, uh, giving us this project and uh, thank you for the time today to present. There is a feasibility study, which I believe I see all of you have copies of. And there's also some maps I have up uh, there also, some left by 17 colored maps. Uh, those same maps were presented at the uh, landowners meeting. It's a very condensed version of the feasibility study, um, basically some maps and then also some cost estimates and things like that. Uh, Cindy did put an agenda together for us. And unless there's any questions that we can start with, we will uh, dive into our PowerPoint presentation. Okay. You might want to tilt that screen just a little bit so there you can actually see it. Is that better? Okay. Uh, we can start today uh, feasibility study uh, back in April, as Cindy alluded to. Uh, ISG was selected to do a feasibility study to look at the overall condition of uh, County Ditch 10 and to present some facts and some findings to the county board. And we uh, appreciate that we do that today. A couple pictures on there, are actually some pictures from our drone. As part of our project, uh, we did fly the entire system. I believe I saw that video playing this morning out on the big screen TV as I walked into the building here. It's about a half hour video. 
uh, very uh, informative, a uh, really great way to look at the system and really helped us prepare our, our, our presentation here for the board. Uh, Bailey and I will kind of go back and forth between the, um, just lost the screen share. Hmm. Okay. Looks like your file closed. So you want to open up your PowerPoint again because it's not on there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this one? Yep, that one's right there. Is that one? Yeah, it's, it's a you may want to go down and get, get past that one because that's got that YouTube connection. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. okay. You actually you're gonna to want to go yeah. to Zoom again. Should be a little camera icon. Hopefully. And then this there you go. This presentation was from our landowner meeting. We have uh, Chuck and myself showing on there. Um, like I said, Bailey's here today with us. So a little bit on ISG. Uh, we have 11 offices in four different states, um, Minnesota, Wisconsin, South Dakota, and Minnesota. Uh, we have a full, full suite of services, architectural, engineering, environmental, and uh, planning services. Presentation. We're going to talk about the watershed, a little bit about the history, some of the existing conditions, proposed conditions, costs, and then the process if the county range authority decides to move forward. You want to start with this one? Sure. So uh, today we're uh, talking about a preliminary engineering or a preliminary repair report, which is kind of the pre phase to a lot of additional steps if we were to move forward with a repair. Uh, proceeding. So this is kind of the first step on looking at a high level overview of our options of what we could move forward with today. Um, and then um, depending on how we move forward, that would uh, kind of determine how long and how rigorous the process would be throughout the repair proceedings. Uh, the, the, the picture shown right there with the red circle, um, the triangles and the boxes in blue are follow a typical repair proceeding. And the boxes in the green and the gray are an improvement proceeding. Uh, we did not include any improvement provisions within this report. Uh, we looked only at the repair side. With the repair side, the repair process is a much simpler, much quicker process than doing an improvement. Um, talk about existing conditions and capacities. The screen, uh, the aerial photo or the picture on the screen is actually the outlet of the current ditch system right now. So. County Ditch 10 uh, lies within Belle Plaine Township in Scott County. It provides drainage to approximately just over 10,000 acres. Um, there's about 101 feet of elevation difference uh, within the watershed. Uh, the soils are classified CD, which is a uh, classification which changes depending if they're drained or not. It's a type C soil if it's drained, a type D soil if it's not drained. And most of the Ag use or the, the land use is uh, agricultural row crops. A little history on County Ditch 20 or County Ditch 10, Scott County 10. It was originally constructed in 1923. It contained a main ditch and five spurs, five spurs, and then uh, three branches off of two of the spurs. Um, we won't hear us talking much about spur number five. Spur number five was basically eliminated during the 1979 improvement. It was dug on top of spur five. So spur five really doesn't exist anymore. In 1923, there was just under 42,000 uh, lineal feet of open ditch, just short of 10 miles. Uh, grades range from a half a percent, which is a fairly flat grade to 0.72%, which is actually a fairly steep grade for an open system. Uh, ditch bottom varied from 14, feet in width at the outlet to three feet in width at the beginning. Uh, there was 4,000 feet of tile also included in the 1923 project on two of the spurs. That's eight, 10 and 12 inch. And a uh, majority of the tile was replaced uh, a number of years ago. Um, the one, one branch was replaced. In 1970, actually 1975, which isn't shown on here, there was an improvement uh, petition on uh, County Ditch 10 to deepen, widen, and lengthen County Ditch 10, and also include another branch. 
That project eventually turned in what's called the Scott LeSueur Joint County Ditch Number 10 project. And sometime around 1976, 1977, that project was actually rejected. The, the petition was rejected due to lack of an outlet. Uh, when that project ended, there was a repair petition that came forward to basically fix what was left or fix the ditch in 1978. They cleaned about 20 or 33,000 feet of ditch in 1978. You'll notice that it's a little bit different than the total length of the ditch. Um, they left off spur two and part of the main system was not cleaned. They also replaced 11 culverts at that time in 1978, and then they lowered three culverts. Uh, something to note for the drainage authority in the 1978 repair project, the drainage authority took over ownership of all the culverts also. Um, they made it the county's policy, the drainage authority's policy to not only maintain, but also to replace the culverts. So any culvert replacement on this system actually be paid for by all the benefited landowners. At the same time as the 1978 repair project was going on, they received another petition in 1979 to do an improvement. Um, this improvement actually did move forward. They improved 7,000 feet of the open ditch. Um, that included widening and deepening of a portion of the system. It also included a, a two, se two segments of uh, straightening. They straightened out the, the original alignment. They placed a couple of new culverts. One was a large arch culvert, and then they lowered one of the large one of the larger arch culverts. And they also extended the outlet about 1,400 feet downstream. The 1979 improvement, although it's not noted on here, was also in conjunction with uh, work on what's called uh, County Ditch Number Three, uh, which we will see here. <clears throat> Um, this photo right now, and this is one of the ones that was included in the handout to the landowners and discussed at the landowners meeting, is the overall watershed for the system. Uh, the area you see in the red to the top is the County Ditch 10 watershed. Uh, these watershed breaks are generated from LIDAR, which is the contour lines that are, were generated from the flights back in about 2010. Uh, these are preliminary lines. If anything is done on the system, such as retermination of benefits, these would be trued up and corrected. Um, they are uh, basically our best uh, estimate at this time what the watershed is going into there. We did have some discussions with a couple of landowners at the meetings, and these will have to be adjusted. There's some areas shown inside the red that actually do drain, uh, drain a different direction. Those will be corrected if, if this project were to move forward. There's roughly, if I can see here, 3,440 acres of watershed within the existing County Ditch 10 uh, watershed. Uh, County Ditch 3 is the one to the south. That is the yellow lines, um, that area that extends down into the Sewer County. And that's an additional 6,820 acres, which drains into County Ditch 10. And then at the outlet of County Ditch 10, where it turn, goes into what's uh, considered Raven Stream, there's just over 10,000 acres of watershed draining through there. Uh, some of the existing conditions we found out there, uh, while we were not asked to look at tile capacities or any of the, the tile branches on the system, uh, those tile capacities are below a half inch per day. The half inch per day is kind of the industry design standard of what tile is designed for, for modern agricultural purpose. Uh, basically the half inch day means that's a half inch of runoff in a 24 hour period that that tile line could, could handle that the capacity of tile line is half inch of runoff from the acreage. Open ditches are generally considered modern drainage design capacity at one inch per day, one inch of runoff in 24 hours uh, draining through the system. Uh, three of the open ditch culvert crossings are below that one inch per day uh, drainage coefficient. And then nine of the open ditch crossings, uh, some of those are the three lists, uh, stated above are actually above legal ditch grade. They were put in too high back in the 1978 repair. The original system is just over 98 years old and we do have a uh, heavy tree cover in multiple locations. Uh, the photos on the screen here do show us some uh, uh, various photos from our drone of the system, uh, showing some of the conditions with trees, showing some of the conditions of some of the uh, culverts in the system, and then just one showing the overall condition of uh, one of the uh, branches of the system. Uh, one of the issues we did find was the outlet for County Ditch 10. As I previously stated, the uh, system was uh, improved in 1979, and they extended the 1923 outlet location uh, 1,400 feet downstream. 
Uh, this aerial photo is uh, taken from your, your website, your GIS site, and it was actually taken in 1980, um, just about the time that actually the ditch was being done. You can kind of see some construction out there. Uh, the purple X's, I just dropped those on your GIS website, and then I could use those as a reference for when I, I, I toggled the photo forward. This is the uh, same picture, same area from 2020. You can uh, note the substantial uh, increase in trees and the tree coverage. Um, where the purple X is to the lower right-hand corner there, that would be the established outlet of the system. That is the responsibility of this drainage authority. A couple of site photos there. Uh, the site photo to the on the left-hand side is the crossing under, oh shoot. Uh, I can't think of the road crossing right now, excuse me. Uh, if I can get it right here. Uh, Galena, that is the crossing underneath Galena. Um, if you look at the video, you can see there's a drop off at the end of that pipe. Um, area to the west of there is considered the flat area. It's very flat ditch grade. And the area to the east of there is the steep ditch grade. There's a, a big grade change there. So there's some, there's an issue with that culvert. And then also just a picture of some of the trees within in the system on various branches. Uh, a couple more site photos. Uh, the culvert on the left-hand side was actually extended in 1978. So the pipe that you're looking at there is pre-1978. And as you can tell, if you look at it real closely, it does have a lot of corrosion and is, is getting uh, long in its life there. Okay. This is the existing watershed, uh, just a blown up area of the um, larger map that we saw before that just includes the, the watershed for the ditch 10 system. This. Sure. Uh, so this is a digital elevation map. So this is what we talk about when we say LIDAR. Um, this it gives us a kind of view of what the elevations are throughout the watershed. So the white and red areas would be the high lands um, with the blue areas and the kind of white areas being the low areas. Um, you can see uh, near the outlet there, it's relatively flat. And that's what we kind of have been mentioning when we say flat areas. We have the flat grade, <clears throat> that 0.05% grade through the open ditch. Um, and then as you move throughout the more upper reaches of the watershed, um, that has a little bit more grade within the system, uh, having higher slopes within the open ditch. Um. Uh, the system has 16 culverts throughout the system, and we've indicated those uh, with the orange dots here. Um, they're a combination of both road crossings and field crossings. Um, a majority of the crossings here are made of metal culverts um, and were replaced during the 1970s uh, repair project. Um, there are a couple culverts that are under the recommended drainage uh, uh, the, uh, the drainage co coefficient. Um, so for open ditches, we recommend that culverts have a drainage capacity of one inch per day. So they have the ability to drain one inch of runoff within 24 hours. Um, and so there are the three culverts that are below that. The one near the outlet, which is a large metal arc culvert. Um, and then there is also two field crossings as we go up through the system. They're number number nine and number fourteen. Is it sure can right. um, These the three culverts. Is it is it just a pure capacity issue, or are they bent or obstructed, or like what puts those three below the one inch? Both. So they're um, mainly it's capacity for the calculations here although there are mostly metal culverts which are reaching the end of its life. So that's another reason that we would recommend the replacement of those culverts. There's one of them has reverse grade on it. It's actually laid, laid the law in place the wrong direction. So it slopes the wrong direction, which really burns up your capacity for culvert. Uh, mm -hmm. Like Bailey said, the first one is basically just too small. It's a, it's a large multi-plate. It's a, a 12 foot by seven foot culvert. So it's it's a it's a really big structure, um, and then one is just one is just designed wrong. So yeah, the twelve by seven feet. It's a multi plate. It's a twelve. It's twelve foot in span by almost eight foot tall. Yeah, it's called a multi plate. It's a three piece. Uh, they bolt them together. Um, when culvert number two was installed, it was actually damaged 
during the installation back in the 70s, they dented the top or partially crushed it. And that's been watched and analyzed for a number of years. It's in your records and things like that. Um, Multi-plates were a very efficient uh, way to put in drainage structures. Um, but as Leslie can tell you, and I can tell you, that they have some issues once in a while with crushing under the bottom. They, the bottoms crush on them, and they actually tent up in the bottom. They actually stick up in the air. It's yeah. kind of cool. It inhibits the water flow and stuff. It's side pressure. Yeah. It's like if you're pushing on a an, an oblong shape, it'll actually crush the, the bottoms up. We have not looked at those per se, but they're approaching 40 some years or 40 some years in life, and that is a common problem with those structures. So. Yeah. And you said they would handle an inch of water a day or something? Yes, one inch water. chance there would be more than an inch of rain. Yes, definitely. Um, that's your modern agricultural design is one inch per day. Um, of course, you can get rainstorms that come through that give you four inches per day, five inches per day. Um, the outlet capacity just isn't there for that. Um, this way it does, the one inch per day gets uh, most of the heavy rains off, which in 48 hours, which affects crop yields and not drowning out crops, but also does allow for some storage then too. So we don't just push all this water downstream. You can't push your problem downstream on top of your neighbors. So the one inch per day is kind of the, the modern design right now for agriculture. Now, what about the, the other thing I know is the wing wall, it looked like some, it, getting around the sides of it, there was like very little protection to the side slopes. I yes. we're gonna hit on that, but sure. it seemed that some of those wrinkle tin culverts had that issue as well. <laughs> it is a common practice um, when we do a system now repair is to uh, rip wrap the inlet and outlet sides of culverts in the side slopes. Um, we all know what happens when you get a lot of rain, you get eddies and currents and hydraulic changes within a channel, you, you creates erosion. And if you look at the photos, you can see on the outlets, uh, a number of the, the ditches have, they have scour holes out there. Uh, we rip wrap the, the inslopes, the side slopes, and actually the channel bottom of those areas to try to burn up some of the energy. It's a very common construction practice now. In 1978, that really just wasn't looked at. They went out and dropped the pipe in and put dirt over the top of it. and called it good. So um, this project does involve a lot of riprap as we get to the costs and things like that. It's one of the expensive items is riprap and protecting all those in slopes and protecting that from uh, future damage. Because we all know we're going to get big rainstorms again. They seem to be very common. So other questions? You're promising one of those rainstorms. I, know, probably you're right. <laughs> I have dealt with too many floods in my life. So I, I don't want to, I don't want a big downpour. <laughs> so yes, we do need rain though. I will agree with that. Um, Bailey did hit on this existing capacities. This, this handout is also in the handout, uh, looking at the drainage coefficients, uh, culvert sizes, grades, and things like that. Um, the last column right there is depth to uh, legal grade. Any of the, <clears throat> excuse me, any of the numbers that have a positive number, like crossing number four plus 1.2, that means that that culvert is uh, 1.2 feet above the legal grade. Uh, during the repair project in 1978, and uh, your drainage inspector, Dan, will uh, account to this, there was an issue out there with grades. They got off on a bad elevation, a bad benchmark or something like that, but they fought a grade issue the entire repair project. Um, they actually had to go back and lower part of the ditch to get it down where they thought it should be. Uh, hence, you'll see a, a number of these culverts were installed or actually do exist above legal grade at this time. We were able to get out with our survey crew and survey most of these culverts and take a look at them. And that's what we use to determine the elevation above grade and then look back and uh, pull the, the legal grade of the system. So a proposed design. So there are a couple of things that we look at when we uh, do these analysis on open ditch systems. Um, one is the drainage capacity, which we already kind of touched on quite a bit already looking at that one inch per day of runoff being the industry standard for open ditches. Um, we also wanna look at erosion, which we just also talked about. So um, adequately protecting those side slopes and putting riprap along the culverts that we'll be um, replacing or repairing. Um, there are, are, are also traffic considerations. So road authorities do have an option of upsizing culverts to ensure that their roads don't flood. So higher than the one inch per day. 
um, drainage coefficient. Um, we also look at multi or multi-purpose drainage management. So looking at alternative VMPs or alternative practices that may not be increasing drainage, um, but installing practices on the landscape that can help to um, help have better drainage while also helping to provide best management practices on the land for the environmental considerations. Um, and one of those things that we do look at for these repairs are alternative side inlets, um, which are an alternative to the typical um, drop intake that would convey water from the uh, top of the ditch down into the bottom of the ditch for the surface water, not subsurface drainage, but surface water drainage into the ditch. Um, Um, sure, we did do an analysis on what, um, we did look at all the culverts, just knowing as a conservative measure of uh, what we would need to do to, if we were to replace any of the culverts. Um, we sized them to adequately drain the one inch per day. Um, and we do recommend that we install culverts using concrete pipe. Um, you see that the metal pipe lasts, you know, 40 years, or really the industry standard is 25 to 30 years for metal culverts, while the RCP pipes, the concrete pipes, will last close to 100 years. Um, and so the cost benefit of those pipes, uh, when you look at the cost difference between metal and, and concrete over its lifetime, the concrete pipes do have a better cost benefit ratio. What, what is that difference? Is it how much more, 50% more? Concrete or? You're looking at, like Bailey said, between 25 and 40 years for metal and close to 100 for concrete. But the cost, the cost difference. difference. The cost, oh, difference. Um, probably about 50% more. Okay. Uh, material prices right now are all, all over the board. What we could have told you a year ago, <laughs> it, it, yeah. tile prices, and we don't have tile in this project, tile prices is up 40% over the last three months. So uh, concrete mm -hmm. pipe has also gone up in cost. We haven't done a lot of metal pipe. We're bidding a lot of metal pipe, but I'm sure Tony can uh, tune, tune in another county engineer. Um, it's just material costs are just really wild right now and trying to gauge that is almost impossible. Mm -hmm. um, proposed repairs. This is also a map that was uh, shown in there. Um, we did do this a little bit different. Uh, there's uh, some areas on this system that are in pretty good shape actually. Um, there's a part of the system close to a three quarters of a mile that really doesn't need, visually doesn't need a lot of repair. It's been taken pretty good care of. It's been cleaned out pretty good. The side slopes look really good. We didn't really include any uh, maintenance on that part of the system. However, when we started looking at things, there are a couple of culverts in that area that are high. They're above their legal grade. So even though visually it may not need any repair, we may actually may need to clean it out just because that when the culverts are lower than the existing ditch is actually higher um, than what it should be. Then we had some areas we call light, light repair. Uh, we have some vegetation coming into the system. It's starting to narrow the channel up. It'd be a good time to grab some of that out and fix some of the minor, minor issues along, along the system. Then we had some areas of what's called medium or very heavy repair. These are areas where the channel is starting to meander. There's a significant amount of material in the bottom of the system. You have some significant sloughing, which means the banks are letting go, actually sliding into the system due to undercutting. So we, we, we put together kind of four different areas that we thought of as what would need repair. Plus we included tree areas. We have just about four and a half acres of trees that should be removed in the system uh, along specific pieces of the, of the system. Uh, a lot at the outlet. And then also the tree areas are shown on this map, I believe in kind of an orange color. And then like I said, all the culverts are also numbered there. Also. Um. <clears throat> we put together a couple different repair options um, that range in size and scope, and then also uh, different costs with, with, with those different options. Our first option would consist of cleaning 37,760 feet of open ditch, which is a majority of the open ditch. Um, clearing 4.5 acres of heavy vegetation and trees. We would replace culvert number four, number five, eight, nine, 11, 14, and 16. And those are the culverts that we deem to be in disrepair or didn't have adequate capacity. Um, and then we would armor the remaining culverts uh, with riprap that would be adequate capacity and condition at this time. 
um, we would armor the tile outlets that come into the open ditch. So uh, preventing erosion along the open ditch areas. Um, and then we would also repair the sloughs or bank damages that are along the, the open ditch right now. The second option is very similar to the first, although it re uh, considers replacing additional culverts. Um, this would this replace all the culverts that are above the legal grade, get them down to legal grade. Plus it also replaces uh, number one, which is that large multi-plate, um, just as a cost savings. Uh, that large multi-plate is about 125,000 itself uh, with the concrete pipe. So this would get rid of all the culverts that are less than a drainage coefficient and all the ones that are above the legal grade. And then option three, uh, same amount of cleaning with the same tree removals. And then it gives you a cost for all the, uh, replacing the all of the culverts throughout the system. Um, and we like to get, prepare this option just to give you an idea of um, the total repair cost if that were to happen. And we did not include a uh, improvement option. Uh, this was a repair report, so we didn't include any options that would involve improving, deepening, widening, and things like that. Okay. Chair, if I may, yeah. we'll move on. Um, considering the world we're living in and just the funsies, um, if, if these options were to go out to bid today, yeah. like how close do you think these numbers are to what the bids might actually be? Uh, those are based on bids that we have received up till last week. Okay. So yes, I believe those are fairly close. If material prices continue to inflate um, with the number of crossings, um, you're probably going to see your, your pipe prices go up. Um, what we've seen is the cleaning prices have been fairly steady. The earthwork contractors are looking for work. Um, they're able to have some contractors in the area that are able to do this work, but it's the material prices, it's the culvert crossing, it's the tile that are really driving up our, our costs. But these are based on our most current bids. The cost estimates also include a 10% contingency. So there's a little leeway within that. Thanks. <clears throat> The cost estimates are developed off of a standard kind of set of specifications that we use for our, what IHG recommends for um, open ditch repairs. Um, and we like to provide some photos and a, give an example of what we do um, and what construction would look like. So this first photo is the typical tree clearing. Um, we would remove all the vegetation within the 16 and a half foot buffer easement that the, the drainage authority um, is responsible for but from the buffer law. Um, this is a photo of typical open ditch cleaning. So uh, they do clean the bottom of the ditch along the, um, the channel, getting that uh, full capacity of the trapezoidal channel with the full width of the bottom width, width that's within the records. Um, we do try to ensure that they try to leave as much vegetation along those banks as possible to try to hold the banks in and not to undercut those the toes um, so not to undermine the bank at the bottom of the ditch there uh, here's a photo of a typical side slope repair so this is when we do see those bank failures and the material does slough into the ditch um, those the material will be uh, brought back up and compacted in with fill and if in serious situations or areas where we think that maybe there might be bank uh, failures, we'll add riprap along the bottom of the ditch to hold in that, that material. And generally, we do put some type of um, erosion control blanket or something like that on top that get the seeding started yeah, to this, hold the seed in there too to get that uh, get as repaired as best as we can. But yeah, this is before seeding. Before seeding, yes. Uh, this is a typical tile outlet repair. As I mentioned, this is included in the cost estimate. All of the tile outlets that are in disrepair will be replaced with uh, plastic or PVC pipe. Um, and we will place riprap at the outlet of all of those culverts to ensure that um, there is an additional erosion along the, the ditch. And this is a typical road culvert crossing. This is pictures of open cutting for the road culvert crossings. So they would open a trench, um, lay the pipe and the foundation for that. Um, for the concrete pipes, we do require all the sections to be tied um, and then would be compacted and filled back in and the road would be restored. Would you need one as big as 
Those are fairly large culverts. Actually, actually the, the culvert we have is larger than that. Yeah. It's 169 inch span. You can drive a car through it. Well, that's just to say that that's for our future light rail. Go back. <laughs> <laughs> um, and can you speak to that? And and maybe that's John Kolb too. I see some road authority costs here, and these are township roads. Yes. Um, how, from a legal perspective, and our decisions here, how does that fit in? Um, I can handle a little bit on the, the. As per the statute, the road authorities are responsible to take care of their road crossings uh, during a repair. Uh, so any crossings that cross the township roads, we have four of them, three of them, excuse me. Those would be the responsibility of the township. Um, those are 72 inch pipe, I believe is what we had figured on there. Those costs are paid for uh, by the township through the road authority. That's by statute. So that culvert right there, what you're showing right there is probably about a 10 by 10 box. Um, that was a little bit smaller than what would be going into a crossing number one and crossing number two. Crossing number one is a 169 inch arch. So you could drive a car through it. Uh, we will place riprap on both upstream and downstream of the culverts to prevent erosion and scour holes within those culvert crossings. And then uh, we'll also put as a BMP, uh, multi-purpose drainage management practice, the alternative side inlets is something that we do recommend. Um, and this is what they, they kind of look like. You can see on the on this side, the um, surface water drainage into the open ditch. Uh, we do have a side inlet calculator that helps to um, correctly size those alternative side inlets to help um, provide temporary storage of water along the open ditch banks. So we try to aim to size those to hold water along the banks for 24 hours to allow for sediment to settle out um, and to not to overload the open ditch during some of those larger rain events. These uh, practices um, have been looked at by NRCS and are eligible for grant funding. And we have been successful in receiving grant funding in a number of counties throughout the state to uh, actually help get the, getting these paid for instead of having the drainage authority pay for them. Uh, that request has been made to the Scott County Soil and Water if they would consider uh, funding some of these alternative site inlets. I know Jaburba, which is kind of the southern, southern Blue Earth area and things like that, uh, we've been very successful in getting funding for those, uh, grant fund to pay for these. Um, now onto costs. Uh, we talked about the repair option one that was replacing of the uh, five culverts, six culverts, excuse me, seven, and then cleaning of the, those uh, pieces of the system. We're looking at a total cost to the landowners, or to cost of the landowners construction about $932,000. That can, and also includes about $120,000 in road authority costs, which is the cost that would have to be paid by the township road authority. Um, <clears throat> total repair cost just over a million dollars. We did include a redetermination of benefits cost of $21,000 through the redetermination of benefits and then the uh, dam damages for the buffer acquisition. Uh, last time benefits were determined on County Ditch 10 was in 1978 as part of the repair project. It was about $188,000 in benefit. Um, that is not nearly what would be needed uh, for this uh, project to take place. The, the benefits would have to be updated if they're to be repaired by petition. Um, Returning of benefits is a process to basically go back and reassess the value of the property and the value that the drainage gives to that property. Uh, we are seeing generally in that $750 to $1,300 per acre uh, ag benefit now when you do returnage benefits depending on what your soil types are, uh, crop, cropping history and things like that. So redetermination of benefits also is uh, very positive for the <clears throat> people along the system. Uh, as you are aware, this buffer law came in a couple of years ago where the buffers had to be put in place, 16 and a half foot minimum buffer along a drainage mm -hmm. system. Um, those costs are then um, those damages or those that, that easement, or that's not an easement, excuse me, that those costs for that buffer are then bore by the system. And then the landowners who put those in are reimbursed for those costs uh, on part of the system. Uh, uh, Attorney Cole will be much better at discussing that than I am, uh, but the redetermination benefits does a, a force to require the buffer. And then those, those buffers are uh, paid back to the landowners along the system. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, uh, this is Commissioner Beard. Um, 
uh, where, is the attorney going to have an opportunity to explain a little more how that buffer strip acquisition and benefit distribution works? Uh, that that was my question in this whole project: is uh, are that considered a taking? Uh, does it be, who who ends up owning it? And uh, maybe questions that are beyond the, the scope of this hearing today. But uh, will there be an opportunity to have that that education shared with us? I think that could be addressed right now, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. If you would, please. Thank you. It, uh, the five, I'll take that, as an, invitation. I'll take that as an invitation to unmute and, and uh, provide an explanation. Uh, Commissioner Beard and, and members of the board, the, uh, the buffer requirement uh, arises under two different portions of Minnesota law. The most recent one, and I think the one that uh, Mr. Pettis was talking about is the repair and protection law under chapter 103 F. Uh, that is a non-compensated regulatory requirement that the owners of property adjacent to a public drainage system are required to maintain a strip of perennial vegetation 16 and a half feet in width adjacent to the top bank of the ditch. Um, and so I'm not sure what action Scott County took with regard to that law, whether you adopted an ordinance and you're actively uh, requiring that or whether you deferred to the state uh, for enforcement activities. But regardless, uh, your SWCD has some requirements under that law and I'm sure has documented where buffers are present and absent. Um, and that is again, a non-compensated requirement of Minnesota law. The compensated requirement that Mr. Pettis talks about is actually found in the drainage code. It's in uh, section 103E as in echo 0 0.021. And it requires that anytime viewers are appointed for the determination of benefits or damages, then as part of that process, the drainage authority is required to acquire a use restriction adjacent to the ditch, 16 and a half feet in width minimum, uh, for the purpose of protecting the ditch uh, by both stabilizing the bank, preventing basically farming over the edge of the bank, and then also creating a vegetative buffer that in many instances, depending on the configuration of the ditch, can uh, uh, eliminate or limit the volume of sediment that might be flowing off of fields into the ditch. Um, and that's really what we're talking about here is the drainage code required buffer area. That is a compensated requirement, um, even though other law requires it to be there anyway. And it really uh, provides a different level of enforcement authority and requirement. And it was originally put into law in the 19, I think about 1987. And it was for the purpose of stabilizing ditch banks and in theory, reducing overall maintenance costs. Um, what you've heard Mr. Pettis and uh, Ms. Griffin talk about already today is that there are several areas along the channel of County Ditch 10 that are sloughing in. Um, often that has to do with too much pressure on the ditch bank. Um, and so it also has to do with volume of water in and in the ditch itself and, and stabilization activities. So uh, that's, that's how ditch buffer works. Um, and unfortunately, if you appoint viewers, the law is very clear, then you must go through the process of determining the damages, awarding them, and making record of that restricted use adjacent to the ditch. It becomes and a pertinence of the ditch. Um, so the landowner still owns it. It's simply a use restriction. They can make whatever use of it is consistent with the ditch as determined by the drainage authority, but absolutely row crop cultivation is prohibited in that 16 and a half foot area. And that's the same restriction that exists in the uh, 103F riparian buffer law. Well, that's amazing. And probably explains some of the angst in the creation of that ditch law that Governor Dayton was pushing. Because it seems like in some cases where the ditch is collapsing and restrictions are in place, uh, what amounts to a taking uh, can can be compensated. But in the rest of it, where it was just, no, you're going to leave 16 and a half feet and not farm here, that's, that's uncompensated taking. Uh, so it's like the two can kind of bump up against each other there and at some point and, and can really kind of cloud the issue, I would think. 
and that's just a surmising on my part. You don't have to respond, but thank you for the explanation. Uh, there are buffers are buffers and some of them are uncompensated and some of them are, I guess that's what we need to understand. Can they plant alfalfa in there and farm it or? Probably a soil and water, better question um, than ours. According to the Minnesota buffer law, yes. Well, they can. And you could also allow that as the drainage authority for the compensated buffer under 103E. Um, mm -hmm. Again, the, the, the issue there really has to do with, is that uh, beneficial or detrimental to the stability of the ditch? Especially when you're, if we've acquired it and paid compensation for that use restriction. Yeah, and that may be the difference because uh, as I understand the Dayton buffer law wasn't about the stability of the bank of the ditch, it was about filtering out sediment from the water, keeping the water clean. And what we're doing is actually uh, stabilizing the, the bank. Uh, which would have a different different function somewhat. And maybe that's the difference in compensation or not. It would appear to me as a layman anyhow that that's the, what we're dealing with here. Uh, thank you. I appreciate you, uh, the explanation. Do you want to continue? What kind of time we're looking at? We don't want to cut it. Good. Good. Okay. It's important. Uh, Bear option number two cost, uh, as Bailey went through, this is just some additional culvert crossings, including the one uh, big crossing number one, 126,000 additional for that. Same road authority costs. Um, total cost of uh, $1.2 million, uh, plus your reaffirmation of benefits costs on the bottom. So it's a project cost of about $1.3 million for repair option number two. Um, this would get rid of all the culverts that are less than a one inch drainage coefficient and then um, all the culverts that are above the legal ditch grade. And then the repair option number three is to basically clean the ditch and then replace all the culverts. Um, this would be a, a kind of a clean slate option, um, total cost of 1.3 million, 120 some thousand in road authority costs. Total cost of about 1.5 million when you bring in the uh, reaffirmation of benefit cost. Is that can I uh, this one clear? If you got some money from the state or whatever, that one point five, where, where would that be? I believe we had um, ten ASIs in there at about twenty seven hundred, so about twenty seven thousand for ASIs. I'll turn it aside and let's that, that would come down. Um, you are eligible to receive dollars uh, from other funds, uh, from other sources to do these projects. Granted, there's not many of them out there, but any type of those. Um, what kind of percent could they expect to reduce that? Five, 10, 20? No, no, no. no. Well, I would so say it's very minimal. Very Under minimal. Five. ASIs. Oh, okay. Unless you do some sort of other additional practice that would be more water quality focused, okay. that's where you would be able to. So that could all be sucked up by the contingency cost. There, there are some. There are some landowners uh, in the system that we met with last week that are looking at the possibility of some wetland type projects. Um, one probably more feasible than the other one. Um, there may be some abilities for some wetlands and some storage, which could bring in some dollars from other entities that may cut down on the repair costs. You may be able to not repair an area of the system if you do some type of a wetland project. Um, those are highly driven by the landowners and their desire to do those. Um, but it, if one or two of those projects could be brought in, there could be some reduction in the cost uh, for the system. A piece of the system that may not have to be taken care of may possibly be abandoned in the future because it's really not needed. But uh, we did have a nice discussion with a couple of landowners about some wetland projects. There's some storage projects out there within this system. Um, soil and water would probably be the contact or the starting point with those. So I to keep dumping on you over there. Really do. <laughs> but that's a good point. And, and during the public hearing, you know, we hope if you have ideas or things that you've thought about already that you'll chime into. Yeah, soil and water is a very important part of this process and working with them is critical. Can I ask, you talked about 10 minutes ago about a section that was pretty clean and whatever, that was- Yes. Whatever. 
Was that by accident or on purpose? No, that's been taken care of. You look at um, the, the map that was put together by Scott County staff here. They've been in there cleaning that part of the city. Yeah, okay. That's been cleaned out. It's this piece right here. It's basically from this crossing, Galena, crossing number four up to about crossing number six here. This is in pretty good shape. However, these two culverts are high. Oh. So if you drop those culverts down where they belong, then that piece that looks visually really good, your, your flow line of your ditch, because it's very flat. Yep. This is very flat. This is a half inch of fall per hundred feet in here. This is eight and a half inches of fall per hundred feet. That doesn't move fast. So it's slow, 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 then it drops through here and runs pretty fast. But it's this piece right in here that, that's in really good shape, actually. Huh. Uh, but that may change if we lower that culvert. If repair plans are put together, we'll need to do a full survey out there. We can go out and cross-section it, take uh, elevations. We'll also take soil samples in there. That'll give us a much, much better idea how much of the system needs to be repaired, uh, how much material actually needs to come out of the system. So this is a fairly high level flyover looking at that. So, yep. So follow up to that, who's been doing the cleaning on that section? Uh, your drainage authority, your uh, uh, ditch I, inspector. I'm curious if some landowners are getting out there doing their, you know, or, okay. Please don't, please don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was, a <laughs> that, that's a question, but that's why I wanted to you know. Some landowners, though, do spray for weeds and things. Weeds, and weed trees. spraying as yeah. trees, that's fine. Um, don't, let them, don't let them dig in your ditch. Um, but it seems to me that, you know, some of the herbicide type preventative maintenance. We'll get, we actually have got a slide coming up on that. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, we do. Well, are any of the um, township culverts big enough to be a township bridge? No, you get 72 inches. So none of them were big enough to hit the 10 foot? No. Question I did pose to your county staff though is if we were to replace culverts one and two, they would both qualify as bridges. They are bigger than a, they're more than 10 feet in span. Mm -hmm. um, but they're not on any of the township roads. No. However, um, it's a real gray area. Uh, what do you do with bridges that are on public drainage systems? Because in essence, they are owned by the drainage authority, which is a public entity but they're not on a public road. So they're not under the county. Uh, DOT has some counties where they have them on their bridge inventory as a kind of a non-public bridge, a publicly owned non-traveled bridge. We, we had a park bridge like that. Uh, some counties completely ignore them. They're out there, we know they're there, but they're not on the road, so we're not gonna inspect them. So, but yeah, these if these two actually, right now, both of these do qualify as bridges. They're, they're more than 10 feet mm -hmm. in length. But none of them on the township. Not on the road. Not on the township roads. No, these are seven, 72 inches. I think they're all three 72 inch culverts right now. This is a 24 down here. It's a little one down here. Yes. Yep. More questions? Yes. The, the culverts one and two. What, what's the actual cost of those two projects? The, uh, the culvert itself? A uh, hundred. Um, culvert number one, we anticipate a cost of that culvert of 125,981. And then culvert number two, crossing number two is 107,671 is our estimated cost. They are in this document right here. <clears throat> Moving to uh, culvert four, that's the one that's 1.4 feet too high? Correct. Okay, what? That cost of that culvert would be picked up by the township. Yes, fifty-four. What, what's the cost? Fifty-four thousand. For me, fifty-four thousand. Fifty-four thousand. So, if that culvert were lowered, how would it affect that the grade of the ditch going west? The if the culvert were lowered, it would be cleaned out to its legal elevation, um, so that the ditch, the culvert grade would be lowered to match that culvert. So we can assume that in 1979, that was not done. It was not. Dug to the proper elevation. Correct. <laughs> However, af after the project was going in 1979, they came back somewhere in this area here before crossing, no after crossing number five, they actually lowered a big piece of the system. They went back into the change order and lowered the ditch a foot and a half. And that's why culvert seven, Excuse me, culvert six and culvert seven are actually too deep. 
So this this part was lowered over here, but they didn't come and lower this down here. Okay, so the uh, that uh, culvert on uh, culvert four mm -hmm. that cost would be passed on to the township. Is that a deduct in your estimate, or is that included? That's included in our estimate if it's listed as a road authority cost. Okay. It's not in the landowner cost. Okay. The other thing is, could you you mentioned this grant funding? Can you touch on that a little bit? Actually, defer to soil and water. Actually, because that, that's what we made the request to. Is it um, grant funding regarding the sidings? Pardon me. Regarding the sidings. Um, well, you get the sidings. Yeah, yeah. 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 Side could, you, I mean, that... could you come over and speak into the speaker so other people could hear about the grant? Oh. Uh, my my first question, I guess, regarding that was, um, is the only grant funding that you mentioned regarding the side inlets? Um, That's the most common that we run into. Okay. Yep. And so um, regarding that, yeah, um, if you any areas that would qualify or um, need a side inlet, we could come take a look, um, do a survey design, and um, we have grant funding available to help install those practices. And so are you thinking like like the question before it would be maybe like in the twenty five to thirty thousand dollars so it wouldn't make a huge difference it'd be like a two percent difference is that yeah I couldn't put a price, price on it, it not knowing how many yeah. or how big they are okay. um, but it'd be fairly minimal in scope to this project mm -hmm. and do you know of any you you asked if it was specific to that grant funding the the side outlets um any other grant funding that you're thinking of or that you guys have been kicking around that could apply to this project? Yes, our general cost share docket with various other conservation practices, um, upland treatments. Um, I think earlier I mentioned wetland restorations that would all fall within our um, cost share financial assistance docket. And that would primarily benefit landowners who are going to be doing some practices during this you know and i i think that's a great opportunity so um but it probably wouldn't impact the total price or the total dollar amount we're looking at here correct correct we would work with landowners um and do start with a site feasibility a site mm -hmm. visit typically we call it take a look at various conservation opportunities um and then from there determine feasibility and work on a cost estimates um, with the ultimate goal of reducing um, slow erosion, um, so maybe it might fit yes. more into kind of the uh, preventative measures yep. type. But it also at the same time, just to expand on what Dan Diane was talking about, side inlet structures is one of our conservation practices that we would take a look at. This is farther down in our presentation here. Oh, um, multi something we have to look at is a multi-purpose drainage management. And these are some of the um, things that we can do or can be done uh, in, in the area or in the ditch system to um, pull in some grant funds and to do some things to cut down on both the quantity of water coming in and also to improve the water quality of the system. Now, granted, this is a repair project. Um, there's not a whole lot of uh, opportunities or some ASI is in here. If you want to talk some more to them too. Well, well let's let's good. clarify where we're at in this. You you you're gonna finish your presentation. Sure. And then the board will have questions okay. and then we'll throw it wide open to the public. So let's stay with okay. that format. Finish your presentation, board questions, and then the public. Mr. Chair, Mr. Mr. Says, Go ahead. You were talking about culverts. I just had a quick question. Mm -hmm. Culverts one and two obviously are quite larger, right? Mm -hmm. You said. How does my question was how does ditch three impact that? Yeah. And what does Thank that you. mean to those sides? Are those the only two? I mean, I was lucky enough to get a tour the other day of all of this, but so I'm kind of curious, are they the only two impacted by ditch three, or how does that play into that flow? Yes, yes. Um Culvers one and two are the only two that are impacted by county ditch three. County ditch three comes in from the south here. This has about double the drainage area of this system. So you go, hence you're going from a 72 inch crossing to a 11 foot crossing. So when they asked you about the cost being at 125,000 and they were significantly mm -hmm. higher, obviously, 
Does Ditch 3 help pay some of those costs? Are they attributed some of those costs so that that would impact sure. how the property owners are paying for those large costs? Yes. Based on the current situation out there with benefits on County Ditch 10 and County Ditch 3, County Ditch 3 uh, paid an outlet fee into County Ditch 10 when County Ditch 3 was constructed. That outlet fee has not continued on in the assessments. So after the outlet was done, uh, any kind of maintenance assessment that has gone on has gone back on the original landowners for County Ditch 10. So right now, County Ditch 10 pays for 100% of the cost of these culverts. If you redetermine County Ditch 10, this piece of ditch is looked at how long it is, how, how large it is, and then an outlet fee is assessed onto the property owners of County Ditch 3. So if you return benefits out here, this system will then pay for a portion of the maintenance of this, this piece and will also pay for a portion of the maintenance of those two culverts. That is determined uh, by the retermination of benefits process. So you'd have a, a, a new listing of your benefits for County Ditch 10, and then you'd have this outlet fee to County Ditch 3, which would be every time you did an assessment out on 10, County Ditch 3 would pay for a portion of it. I can't guess what that percent would be. I believe probably in the 20% range would be a really good guess. That's a complete guess though, that 20% of this cost of the system would then be borne by County Ditch 3. That's part of what's driving the size of those last culverts, right? It's Ditch 3 is The 1978 improvement or excuse me, 1979 improvement project was directly related to the improvement on Ditch 3 to make, make those culverts bigger and deep in that system. So that, that improvement was driven by work done on County Ditch 3. That is correct. Thanks. Thanks, Leslie. And Daryl. Yeah. With that, would you also um, need to redetermine 3? Or it, how would we go about doing that on a separate ditch. When we look at the redetermination of 10 and look at what other impacts flow into it, I guess, yes, it, it's that portion that you outlined on the map, but in your um, professional opinion, is it necessary to redetermine all the benefits on three as well because they are so interrelated? If I could take off my ISG hat and put on my ex-county administrator hat, which I will do right now, the answer mm -hmm. is yes. Um, it makes the most sense to do the entire drainage area at the same time. That way, all the benefits are apples to apples. The outlet fee, which goes on to ditch three, would then be appropri appropriately apportioned to all the landowners on ditch three. Um, trying to do one system, then come back in a couple of years and do the next system creates issues. It's cheaper because you can use the same viewers. You can have the same hearings on the same day. You have one first, you do the second one second. Um, it, it's, it's, it's better to do a drainage area or ditches that impact each other at the same time. Uh, your attorney, Mr. Cole here, will be attending the Lestour County board meeting tomorrow. I believe they're doing six, six, six or eight redetermination of benefits tomorrow. That's basically two drainage areas. Um, these are all the ditches within two drainage areas. They're all on the same page then as far as benefits. So as a former county administrator, yes, it makes the most sense to do a drainage area at the same time. Uh, that way you have the same people in the room. You can have the same landowners because some have land in both systems and it just seems to be a lot cleaner and a lot easier to deal with. So, so keep going with your presentation. Okay. You go ahead. Uh, road authority costs, we've already talked about. This is just a picture of a road. Um, right-of-way lines are the, the blue arrows on there. Uh, everything between the right-of-way lines is the responsibility of the road authority during the repair process. Uh, they are responsible to take care of their crossing. The drainage authority has the ability to tell them that their crossing needs to be upgraded and replaced, and it's at their expense. Uh, road authorities also do pay benefits on the system over and above their there are crossing costs, uh, but there are, there are deductions for damages and things like that. So, uh, MDM, you wanna? We've talked about MDM, uh, which stands for Multipurpose Drainage Management. This is something that we do look at, um, looking at different uh, best management practices that can help to 
um, improve water quality and water quantity. So there are different measures that you can take, preventative measures, control measures, and treatment measures. Um, and these would be some of the things that the SWCD can help with um, planning and working with landowners on implementing. Um, the drainage authority does only have so much uh, leeway. Your kind of e area that you have uh, ability to control is within the 16 and a half foot buffer on each side of the ditch. So some of those other practices that um, will need to be uh, kind of brought on and take the initiative from the different landowners that are on the system that may be more in the upland areas. Um, so some of those practices are grass waterways, saturated buffers, um, wetland restorations, wood trip bioreactors, controlled drainage, um, alternative site inlets, and the ASIs, which is something that we are uh, do as a standard uh, practice throughout our repair studies. Oops. Um, process, the system is somewhat under undersized. Um, it's obviously deteriorating. Um, it hasn't been cleaned up or repair since 1978. And then just the lack of maintenance, uh, tree removals, things like that um, should be should be uh, removed to bring the system kind of back where it's designed. We will follow the 103 E statute, which we have to follow uh, if a project is uh, moved uh, forward, repair or improvement, and those those processes are defined by statute. We have to follow those. Um, we've talked about replacing the metal culverts with concrete, cleaning the existing system. We believe that the project is cost effective, practical, and feasible. It's a necessity for the public, and it does have public benefit and contribute to public welfare of the area. And we do need public input sought on moving forward. Realize that this is their system; they are the benefited landowners. Uh, they pay the bills on this and that the county is the drainage authority is much more of the arbitrator of the bank around these. so uh, we do need the public's input if you are to move forward on this um spraying i know an issue that came up when i talked about discussion on spraying we did reach out to a number of drainage authorities we worked with uh, we received back information from a couple of those uh the sewer county who i'm the most familiar with uh, we did implement a spraying and mowing process about three years ago we do, they, they, excuse me, do about a third of their system every year. These are their costs that they have. They do mow and spray uh, the buffers uh, to keep down brush, weeds, and then uh, also keep down trees. In 2020, they averaged about $217 per acre. That's per acre of buffer uh, ditch, not per acre of the watershed. Uh, they did just over 110 acres. Uh, Blue Earth County, very similar to the Seward County. They, use almost the same contractors even. They're up around the $300 per acre. And then Brown County, is a, they just got a quote for 305. Uh, our most uh, current cost for tree removal is about 10,000 per acre. However, we have seen that cost uh, escalate here in the, the recent past. It's probably more than that right now, um, but spending $300 per acre per year is very cost effective than spending 10,000 per acre to clean trees out. Uh, next step. If you do uh, want to do a repair, desire repair, when you get information from the landowners, we would uh, ask that they would petition the drainage authority, which would be your ditch inspector, Dan Wormer. And then we could put together a timeline if you're looking at retermination benefits and repair hearing. Um, <clears throat> this was a question more for your, a comment more for your attorney. Um, if you, do a redetermination of benefits and have the resolution to redetermination of benefits than any kind of uh, dollars that are expended on putting together repair plans, working on the repair would be um, paid for under the new benefits versus the old one. Right now we're working on the 1978 benefits. Any costs that are put onto the system would go onto those benefits, but once a redetermination benefits is ordered, even though it's not done, then those costs would eventually go on to the new benefited uh, parcel list versus the existing list. So something to keep in mind if that's the direction you desire to go. And with that, I believe we are done. All right, questions, questions or comments from the board or staff? Well, this is a public hearing. Oh, did we? Well, I just, I, I have got one question. I just looking to see. Um, Question is, so I think it was a three or four culverts were not at the legal one inch or whatever it was. Three. Um, and that's based on the old elevation of the ditch. 
presumably that elevation has changed with years and years of silt. If you were to do nothing except leave everything as is, because now that ditch bottom has come up, does that help with the flow? Potentially, I know you haven't done a full survey, so that's one question. And if you were only to do some spraying and maybe take out the four acres of trees, does that get us someplace? Just a question. Nothing behind it. I'm just it's a curiosity question. A question. It's, a, it's a patch. It's hard to say with the silting in. We don't have a full survey, so we don't know what the flow lines are within the center line of the channel right now. Um, so that's kind of a... But it's possible that the, the new, and again, I'm not um, lobbying one way or the other. I'm just asking the question is that ditch bottom has raised over the years to where now the culverts actually are not the below, right? right? Yeah. Um, just, just curiosity. At the same time, there are a couple culverts that do have a lot of sediment in them. Uh, I know one of the arches, one of the big multi-plates has got a lot of material in the bottom of that culvert and that is impacting the capacity. If we're assuming that culvert is clean and has, has designed capacity. It's not, it has material and it has sediment in it. So you've lost some, some end area of that culvert just due to the sediment in there. Um, we're, we're working with grades in this system of a half inch per hundred feet. So if you have a six inch, sediment or six inch blockage in the system that's a thousand feet a ditch that you've impacted. Um, little little things in the ditch can make big impacts sure. in the yep. system. So I, I really can't answer the, uh, I'll have to, have to think some more about your other question about the sediment in the ditch. But. Well, and so that scenario, which likely is happening, right? I mean, it's not what it used to be. And so mm -hmm. there's little ebbs and flows and creates backup. Would someone like, uh, I'll just, just because I want to afford it, but um, the prior liaison to it, would a watershed district say, you know what, we kind of like having this ditch hold a little bit more water as more things are able to settle out versus a more free flowing ditch? Is, is that potentially a benefit to water quality downstream? Again, just asking the question, didn't come here with any agenda, came here to learn and ask questions. And you know, that's would, the good ones, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was going to say, there's a couple inlets, though, that are so obstructed. Yeah. That we saw in this that I believe water is sitting in the fields over 24 hours, which causes damage. Right, sure. Yeah, the right. Yields, right. That's I mean, a yield issue, right? It was unbelievable how full and impacted that was. I, I think the, the crux, some of your question is, can we, can we do a decent job as a ditch authority for a lower price. Can we, can we get enough bang for not spending, you know, this much money? Um, and I think it's a good question. And I think, I think that is something that from some landowners I've heard about, and I think we, sh we should hear that. Like if, if we really can't even spend as much as number one can't or decide, I guess it would choose not to, what, what would be the most bang for our buck? But number two is, I think we got to remember, I mean, People only do this kind of thing every 40, I mean, it's been 40 years 40 since years. We've, we've done something this big. And the whole purpose of this ditch is to serve agriculture. And this is still a very agricultural area of the county. It's gonna remain, I hope, an agricultural area of the county. Um, so I, I think we gotta make sure we balance the, the purposes there and make sure we look at, at that research. I, I'm not saying I have an answer, right. but I, I think we gotta remember the purpose of this system because if we're not gonna benefit agriculture, we, we do this all differently. I mean, I think if we were just, if, if it was going to be 10 acre lots and, and lots of wildlife, we'd have a whole different system, but this was put in place to benefit agriculture. And that's why the, the benefit, the determination of benefits is so important. So, but I, I think a fair question, I think something that some landowners want to do know, is there something less we can do that's, that's going to be worth it. But then from my standpoint of I don't think I'll be at this table in 10 years. Does that mean that in 10 years, whoever's at this table yeah. is really dealing with all again, you know, are we just kicking the can down the road too? So, and I, I was with Leslie on that tour and fortunate enough to see a lot of these culverts up close, um, the tree coverage up close. It, it was very different than seeing the pictures in the drone. I really thank Mr. Jurison for that because um, it was, it was good to be there. It changed 
There's my thoughts about this. Some deflection on some of those culverts. Yeah. Which gets at their integrity, which is a little bit concerning. But um, there are quite a few places, Commissioner, where it is silted in and it is above. I, I mean, it it really does need to be cleaned out. And you can see where some of that scouring is taking place. Well, and just just to be clear, like I'm not again, I'm not asking the question with any motive. Right. Um, agenda or angle but it's, i feel better making any decision with having a full right i think it's another option to be on the table that we should be considering i agree with that and, uh, Mr. Chair, um, Go ahead. so and just to kind of take out take along with Bob said you know if it's 1.5 million to get the 30 40 50 years out of it it's about 30,000 a year and that's not you know it's a lot of money but it's not so bad i mean this day was kind of coming some of this if we go clean it out it's are we putting a finger into a hole and another leak pops? You know, because it's going to move things down, right? I mean, if we just fix one thing, something else is going to fail quicker. So it's like you said earlier, you just got to do the whole thing. It might. This is a landowner. Yep. Right. This is a land right? these, these residents have paid for for the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. um, if you are going to do something with changing grades like that or deciding not to clean some areas, there's processes to do that. You should, you should, you can partially abandon the system. You can take pieces off that aren't going to be a public use and things like that. Or you can, okay, we're not gonna clean this here. And this is gonna be the new grade from now on. So you don't have to have this battle in the future. Um, those are processes and hearings that are required to do that. So there, there's ways of doing that, mm -hmm. but those should be documented so the, the future knows what, what the intent was to do out there. Um, the system was built to drag egg land. That's what it was done for. Mm -hmm. um, the, the residents have, have a property right out there for that. Um, it's our, the, the drain authority's responsibility to maintain the system, take care of the system at the direction of landowners. Um, Gerald, did you hear from any of the property owners that, like on some of these arms? Um, I remember looking at one of them where it looked like maybe there wasn't as much ag anymore and it was so heavily treated that they would want to abandon or not maintain it. Did you hear any of that from some of the property owners? We heard from one property owner that um, because of lack of um, production or farming, active farming, um, they can't really tile this here anymore. So they they won't be able to get the true egg benefit out of the system. If you redetermine benefits and those facts are known or they go into a program, those benefits are adjusted because they don't get. So they're, if you farm it, your benefit would be this, but since you can't farm it, you can't drain it, your benefit mm -hmm. is now this because you have it in this program. Specifically, usually if it's a long-term program, like a RIM program or a CREP program, there, there are reductions in their benefits for that. Um, I didn't hear about, a. Part of the main possibly could be abandoned just because of the lack of maintenance and the wetland complex that exists up there. Um, there's some areas that um, we have to have a discussion with a couple of landowners on, on that. It's a piece way up here uh, about some programs or some projects up in there that that might be one that they would look at uh, maybe not cleaning or maybe actually abandoning or putting the type of structure in for that piece. Our attorney here um, has some comments he would like to make. To help us out. Thank, thank you. Uh, I believe that's the board chairman. I appreciate that. And, and this was related to Commissioner Beer's uh, question and comment. And Cindy had talked at the very beginning of her comments that the board does have broad discretion and that that's an absolute fact. What the drainage code says is that you're required to inspect the system. You're required to do what is necessary to keep the system efficient. And so that lends itself to this exercise of discretion. There are concepts in the drainage code and there are examples around the state of what we call an environmental repair, which really addresses um, the efficiency of the system while trying to keep intact um, and protect the water quality and other uh, environmental functions of the system. Uh, I think first and foremost, if the board considers County Ditch 10 as a piece of infrastructure, which it is, it is a conveyance for water. And it was primarily constructed, probably an improved natural water course or some uh, flowage area anyway, 
um, in order to facilitate and enhance agricultural production. And that need remains within the county and remains a, a, an economic uh, uh, stimulant or, or resource of the county. And so you don't want to, you don't want to neglect that certainly. Um, but the, the engineers have presented you with some options that really focused on restoration of the original configuration and hydraulic efficiency of the ditch. And one of the things that could be looked at, and I believe that this can be looked at not necessarily just with ditch funds, but if you are focusing on water quality and sediment reduction and some of those other issues, it can be uh, other funds from within the county or the SWCD or from grant funds can be looked at to look at these alternatives. And I think that Mr. Pettis and, and Ms. Griffin have, have touched on that. So as you get further into the process of evaluating the needs of County Ditch 10 and its watershed, and you begin to evaluate what portions of the ditch may be more important than other portions of the ditch, it will allow you to begin to prioritize where the uh, physical construction work needs to occur to uh, improve or restore the originally constructed or anticipated hydraulic efficiency of the ditch, and where physical construction may be necessary in order to address um, the degradation, the environmental degradation, bank slope sloughing, the delivery of sediment, scour, those sorts of things. Um, so you're, you're at the original, you're in the initial phases of, of investigating all of that. And when we get to a point where it looks like something has to be done and you determine to do that, then you're gonna to begin to apply those prioritizations uh, based on the needs of the system and not just, you're, you're balancing these requirements, you're balancing the interests of the benefited lands and their expectations, you're balancing the needs of the county in terms of economic activity within the county, which is supported in this area by agriculture. Um, you're looking at the uh, ecological needs of the county and of the public in general, and you are required uh, both by uh, court determined law and by the drainage code to balance all of those things. Um, so these are all great questions, but I just want to reinforce to the board that you have discretion um, there are options available to you. You are not required by law to reconstruct this ditch to its original configuration. There are all kinds of things you can do. And the real question comes down to what strikes the proper balance between the needs of the ditch, the economic interest, the ecological interest, cost, all of those things come in. Um, I also think it's, it's important to note that, that if, if in fact nothing has really been done on this ditch for 40 years, and I, that's a real broad term because I know things have been done, but nothing major. Um, it, it becomes a shock also to the bottom line of ag producers when they've been going for a few generations maybe without paying anything significant in terms of ditch assessment. And suddenly we do a major reconstruction and for the next 20 years they're paying um, for the cost of that. And then that's just eating into their bottom line. So. Um, you know, so oftentimes it's, it's beneficial to the system also as you're moving forward to, to, if you do, if you have to do a reconstruction, then to do just routine maintenance and then routine assessments so that that becomes part of the budgeting process for your ag producers and your landowners, but it also reduces um, the sticker shock of a major reconstruction uh, when you get to a point where the, the conditions on the ditch have deteriorated so much that um, that's just the price. Uh, so again, a little broad ranging comment, but I want to just again, reinforce to the board that you're going to be called upon to exercise discretion and to make some difficult decisions. And, and ultimately, uh, all we can do as staff and as consultants for you is guide you through that process to make sure that the decisions you do make are consistent with law in my case, and are applying sound engineering principles in the case of your engineering consultant. Thank you. Well, the public has been waiting a long time to make comments. So uh, if we have more comments, we'll come back to us later, but let's open up, up to the public now. Any, anybody from here wanting to make comments wide open? Uh, just a little housekeeping. Can, do they need to come up here or can they be heard where they are? No, they should probably come up and say their um, name and address and then uh, speak into the- Yeah, so come up to this chair right here. 
Right, this one right here will. The microphone is fine. This will be right, good, right here. You can stay where you are. But if you want to come up, say your name and address, and come to the chairs, so you can be heard on the microphone. Thank you. I'm Jim Jarrison. I'm from Belle Plaine, uh, Belle Plaine Township. I'm a landowner on Ditch 10. And I guess, Commissioner Beard, is it? When you, maybe I can help you with your question. Uh, the ditch hasn't been cleaned since it was constructed in 1979. And I feel if we uh, were to do a complete clean out right now with the mandate that Governor Dayton put in place for this buffer strip, I think it's going to extend the longevity of a clean out. That helps you any? Yeah, I, and again, I just ask questions. I mean, I, I'm like everyone else, I'm concerned about the cost, but how do we get the most bang for the buck? Are you in favor of it? Absolutely, I'm the one that petitioned for the clean out. I just want to say, because the well, dollar amount of stuff here now is out there. I'm in, in favor, but at what cost? Yeah, okay, and that's what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're all concerned. Yeah. And I guess I'm, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll just, I, I have something here that I wrote down. I want, I want to read to you. I got a question for you. It's Daryl. Daryl, yes. Have you done a projection on the cost of tree removal? Uh, yes, it's uh, 40, it's 10,000 acre and four and a half acres. So 45,000, 50, 50,000. 50, $50,000, yes. Okay. My question is, Who's going to pay for the cost of removing the trees from ditch number 10 that the system has failed to address in 42 years? And my second question is, what is the system going to do moving forward in the next 42 years for the sake of ditch 10? Thank you. So Jim, can I ask a question, Jim? Yes. So if I've heard you, you were kind of a proponent for having a maintenance plan in place like Daryl recommended that Blue Earth and the sewer has, where we do spraying every a third or a fourth uh, every- Some year. sort of an annual or semi-annual inspection of the ditch, uh, spraying. And now with Governor Dayton's mandate, you got 16 and a half feet on each side of the ditch. You can go anywhere anytime you want to do, do any of that. And then if there was some, you would be a proponent of some type of maintenance every third year or something like that, that would do that. And if that I mean, was as far done, as the spraying program, right? We wouldn't have the trees come up. Right. And then with the right. six, with the rod buffer, you wouldn't have the, I have, I have a quarter of a mile of ditch on one side. I've never had a tree in it, but we spray it annually. You spray it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Chair, do we sprinkle questions in here? Yeah, I... or go ahead. But well, I, public, if you come on up next and sit. Yeah, but while you're coming up, we'll let, let him ask a question while you're coming up. Yeah, right. Oh, I'm Leon Bollock. Probably some of you I know. I've worked here for a few years here. Just a few. Time. Yeah. I'm sorry. Same and name. from Belle Plaine, I own some land there in Kitson Boulevard, right on. I got 80 acre, uh, 140 acres. I have spur two <clears throat> is part of it there. Some of that land is, you know, I can't really get to the ditch, to the, to clean the ditch to mow it. Well, I went down there with the mower now and mowed along. I got 16 and a half feet that I own along there that, well, that I have to put in for grass. They, they told me I had to do that. So I mowed that, but the brush, the biggest thing is this ditch is the brush and the trees in this ditch. You can't have trees, you can't have brush in the trees in the ditch. It doesn't, doesn't work, it isn't feasible. We have never had anything done with it. I've been trying to maintain it myself. And uh, but if like Jim's been spraying, but I don't have a sprayer and all this stuff to go on what you got to use and with, with the water quality and what you can or can't do on a ditch. I know the county does a lot of spraying in their ditches for thistles and stuff like that. So I would think something like that would work in the in the county ditch. But there's going to be a tremendous amount of cost on this ditch. That I'm not sure this if there is any other ditch you know of any other ditch in the county that is done this with, as elaborate with the concrete. Uh, you know, it's a very nice presentation. It's a very nice ditch. There's no question about it. But uh, this is a pretty pretty elaborate. If we could maintain this ditch as two culverts, like you said by Delina, I know 
there was an issue when that pipe was put in there. It's too too high. And the water flows like crazy down on the other side and flash and rains land there and it just destroyed that ditch. And they did some previous work. They put some riprap in here now on the one side. I don't know if you probably know about it. Yeah, yeah. Township put some riprap in the crossing. Yes, yeah, again. Township. They, the day we had the meeting, I believe they did it. Yeah, so, it was right at Galena. Right at Galena, yeah. yes. It was the, actually it was probably the day before we were there when they were doing it. It looks it looks very nice, the riprap. Yes, it mm -hmm. looks good, but I yep, seen they're done. doing a good job. Yep. And, uh, but the, that, on, that, on that side of the ditch there, it just tore up that whole ditch. There's trees in there, but we had a big issue when they put that culvert in there. It was put in too high. And uh, they did, they had it said it was original grade, and now we're stuck with this with these two culverts. They're too high, and it slows everything down on the other end. You know, we got to go back in there again and do all you know, re relay this all again. And uh, I just like to see something done to this ditch. Maybe get this drainage, uh, get these trees out of the ditch. You can't have trees in the ditch. And I'm kind of spraying. I'd like to see something done with that. And I know the board's going to make a big decision here on these costs and uh, for everybody, but I went through it in 78, 79 when they did it. So Leon, you know culverts. Yeah. So are, are there a couple, you know, we talk about, you know, um, Daryl said maybe 50% more to go to concrete versus the maples. But are there a couple that maybe we're better off with the concrete for the line? Yes, sir, correct. Township road there, yes. I would say on a township road, there should be a concrete that one on delaying it for sure. Mm -hmm. That one there. And I'm not familiar too much for the other ones that he was this, saying there. This culvert number 10 already is concrete. That's the only one out there is concrete. Existing concrete, the only one out there is all the rest of metal. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, some of them were put in not, not too long ago. I know some of you think they're shot, but I know I. But the other township road, I think it's number seven. <clears throat> like it's in there. Yeah, that, that one. That, one's that, that one is a newer culvert, I believe. Yes, that was just across. This, this yep. So yeah. Was, that one was put in, and I remember that. But so we got know, trouble with beavers on Schmitz now. I talked to Dan there, and and Schmitz, where all them trees are, if you keep the trees out, I think we'll keep the beavers out of there. They're plugging up the road now. I was in there twice with tobacco, trying to keep them open up the culverts already. Because the water is backed up just about I had it one year where when it, it backed up went over into the field. Anyway, but that's I just wanted to mention that to you but as the board and I don't do this too often. So well, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mr. Chair, I'd also like to read uh, something into the record if I can from Ernie Stump, who isn't here today, but sent me an email and I said I please read it. And I also did get a phone call from his wife prior to receiving this and I'll add her comments after I've been get, letting you know what he had to say. I would like to make my thoughts known regarding the proposed clean out of county ditch number 10. I agree that the part of the ditch needs a clean out, but I think the proposed project is a little overly ambitious. As far as replacing the two large culverts, I really don't think that is necessary. If they fail at some time in the future, they can be replaced at that time. As far as capacity of the existing culverts in the last 41 years, there was only one time that there has been a serious overflow. Thank you, Ernie Stump, 7675, Union Hill Boulevard, Belle Plaine, Minnesota. And from his wife, Betty, my comments are, don't take away my life and my wildlife. I love my, my birds and I love my, my deer. And I'm 91 years old. And if this is all I can get out of my quality of life, don't take that away. And so there you go. Um, from the stumps, they appreciate you hearing their comments. Thank you. Other people that want to speak? Anybody? <laughs> you want to share your opinion now, Mr. Schubler? Anybody? It's uh, wide open. Uh, okay, if there is no one else speak, wanting to speak, we'll take a motion to close the public hearing. Do we have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion on that? Okay, we'll roll on closing the public hearing. Commissioner Aye. Commissioner Aye. Commissioner Beard. Aye. Commissioner Beard. Aye. Commissioner Arts. Aye. So more um, 
uh, comments from the board. And then I want um, is it, you know, Leslie or the staff or the lawyer to say, where do we go from here? Yeah. Uh, let's go ahead. You have a comment or question? Uh, I just, yeah, that's just what I would say. Where, where do we go from here? Um, what's the, you know, we did nothing. Like, you know, I think then what's the worst that can happen? I just, I don't know that I, <laughs> I don't know that we want to find that out either. You know, we get down the road and there's a big problem and it's got to be taken care of right away. I don't wait for things to fail at my well, house. You know, in a certain length of time, you're a tree guy. Yeah. A, a field will turn into a forest oh, without yeah. maintaining it. I've done it. <laughs> so there, there was to be no like decision on a project. It was for you to hear the public. It was for you to hear the engineer and then provide direction to our staff mm -hmm. to go back and work with the engineer on what you wanted to see happen, right? So a couple of things I think we've heard is does it have to be as elaborate a project, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think maybe directing them to look at which culverts really need to be replaced, which one should be concrete versus the wrinkle, um, those types of things would be appropriate. The other thing I think I've clearly heard from folks is a recommendation on an ongoing maintenance program and what would that look like in direction to do that um, and some recommendations on that moving forward. But I, I think you've got trees that need to get out of there and brush. We've heard that clearly mm -hmm. from the ag people um, and, and those folks. So what would that take? And then which of these culverts do you want to replace or not want to replace? And then the cleaning so that we get to those right elevations. Or if there's a reason to change the elevation based on what we hear from the public, as Daryl said, there's ways to do that. What would that look like as we talk to folks? So I think it's your direction to our staff on what you want to see us move forward. Um, Mr. Chair, members, there's a couple of different things that I want to also add, and I, I would like John uh, Cole from Lincoln Newton to kind of weigh in because he's the one who's going to help guide on, on the proceedings on, on what's next. So one of the things you have to consider is redetermination of benefits. If that's something that you're considering, then that may be something that's going to, that's going to proceed or go along with in, in tandem with the next steps, which if we look at the cost estimates, I think that we are going to be over the 175, the, the, the total benefit of the dish back in the day. And so with the redetermination, present day values probably are going to need to be adjusted, which would which have to, would um, require also a repair petition. We don't have a formal repair petition, but with that, I may be speaking out of school and I'll turn to John to possibly weigh in on what's next. What do we need to have in order to move forward? Okay, thank, thank you for that. Let's start with where you're at. You acknowledge that you're the drainage authority. You acknowledge that Ditch 10 exists. You have received requests from landowners benefited by Ditch 10 to investigate the needs of the ditch in terms of repair and conditions. So you have satisfied uh, many of your requirements. The ditch has had what I would call an inspection on steroids by the engineer, um, which has identified multiple issues that could be addressed. Um, your next step then to satisfy your requirement under statute is to take the actions that are necessary to be efficient. The system is not completely obstructed such that it is de depriving the landowners of its benefit but it is in need of work. My recommendation would be to begin to prioritize that work based on two things. What is first necessary to ensure that you are restoring the beneficial drainage expected by and anticipated by the landowners. That could mean that you are replacing culverts that constitute obstructions to the efficient flow that could be that you are removing those trees that are creating obstructions to the efficient flow. So that's really based on the efficiency. The second thing that I would do is I would prioritize those actions that are necessary to restore and ensure the integrity and stability of the drainage system. That would involve then clearing the area adjacent to the ditch of trees, which constitute, in my opinion, an obstruction to your maintenance and inspection activities because you can't get equipment in to maintain when the trees are there. Um, and also then stabilizing and restoring side slopes. Um, that 
that next priority could also include the replacement of side inlets. Um, and that maybe then gives you a little bit of time and opportunity to work with your SWCD and some of your other water management organizations locally to secure the funding to, to make that happen. That's how I would approach it, given the price tag and given what I'm hearing, not necessarily a hesitancy, but I think a very sober consideration by the county board of the impact of doing everything all at once. Um, and I've heard concerns about, you know, will, will materials prices and costs of doing this work, will they go down, will they go up? Well, we don't know. And so that's why, again, I would encourage you to look at what are the immediate needs, how do you uh, sequence them and the addressing of them over time so that you can level out those costs to the ditch. And in doing so, you might be able to, on an annual basis, stay under that $175,000 threshold. And over the course of five years, as, as opposed to a year, address 60, 70, 80, 90% of the issues identified by your engineer in a systematic way. And then that, that starts you on a path of systematic maintenance and inspection. Um, so I think you got an elephant in front of you. You got to decide how you want to eat it. And the best answer to how you do that is one bite at a time. And, and I think you're on your way to doing that. So that's how I would, I would address it. Um, if you're not inclined to just, uh, you know, take one big bite and do the whole thing at once would be to sequence out and prioritize and then have a plan that extends over time to address those needs in priority in sequence and then you know, maybe try to keep it within a reasonable time window uh, that balances out then the expectations of landowners with the needs on the pitch. Go ahead. Mr. Chair and, and John, thank you. I, I think that's a great recommendation. I, I firmly believe the redetermination of benefits is needed for all kinds of reasons. So many of these parcels have changed to how, they've, how they use the land, the agricultural benefits have changed, and then the whole issue with ditch three and, and its benefits. How does that fit in and, and um, how do, how, what are the next steps to start that process? Because even if we're gonna do a, a five-year plan of, of eating this elephant over five years instead of one, I guess, um, I would rather see those costs borne by the people who benefit and, and uh, instead of 40 years ago or how many ever years ago we last did that. Mr. Chairman and Commissioner Wetman Brucky, the, the issue of redetermination of benefits goes to your obligation to ensure that everyone who is utilizing the ditch, either by benefiting from it, meaning they're receiving an economic gain from having the ditch as an outlet for improved drainage, or they are burdening the ditch by sending their water and taking up capacity in the ditch, is paying their fair share of the costs on the ditch. So the threshold there is if the board determines that the benefited areas have changed, and that can be based on new areas that were originally not drained to the ditch that currently are, or that can take the form of just a change of land use practice so that some lands are now uh, utilizing the ditch in a way that they didn't during the last determination of benefits. Um, so that's that's one of the thresholds. The other, the easier threshold is that land values have changed, but I'm always cautious of that because you can spend a lot of money on a redetermination of benefits and still end up with the same prorated distribution of benefits across individual lands. So really what a redetermination does is it rebalances who pays what percentage of every dollar spent on the ditch. If you believe that that distribution is not accurate, then you initiate by uh, an initiating resolution, making the requisite determinations. The statutory reference for that is 103E as in ECHO, uh, point 351. Um, it does not require a landowner petition, although it can be initiated by a landowner request. Um, it lies within the discretion of the board. And again, that's why I characterize it as one of your core obligations to make sure everybody's paying their fair share. Um, and that uh, once that determination is made, it 
takes all of the current costs on the ditch, would apply them to the old benefits rule, and basically pauses all the new costs on the ditch and will apply them to a new benefits rule because you've recognized that that's that that distributing them among an old benefits rule is inappropriate. Um, so we would start that with a resolution, requires the appointment of viewers, um, and then requires time to get it done. And so if that's the, the direction the board wants to go, um, then some guidance to staff. I am certainly happy to prepare that initiating resolution for the board. Um, we can put your staff in touch with uh, various different viewing teams that can perform the redetermination of benefits for you. Um, that's, that's, it's kind of your option. There is though, and I would be remiss not to tell you this, there is a second way to fund uh, maintenance of a drainage system that is not based on the benefits rule. And it is, a, it is a pilot provision in the drainage code that allows for the distribution of costs of repair on what's called a runoff and sediment delivery calculation. So what this involves, it involves an engineering analysis of the watershed that contributes to the ditch, the entire watershed, not just benefited acres. And it uh, requires an analysis of their various runoff coefficients based on soils, land cover, land use, slopes, you know, all of those things go into it. And then it comes up with every acre or every you know, little area, polygon, whatever you want to call it, within the watershed gets assigned this value. And then the costs are distributed on that basis rather than prorated based on a percentage of benefits. Um, so that is a second way to go about this. Um, the statutory provision for that, and it's so new that um, I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I will get it in just a moment. I believe it's 728. Yes, 103E728. Yeah, that's all I, I got that one. Look at that. John, what's your legal advice or opinion about using such a, a new pilot? Um, wait. <laughs> It's, it's, it's new and I can only uh, point to a, a few instances where it's been tried. Um, it's effective, um, but again, it's a cost and it doesn't create a new benefits rule. So it's good for that one repair or it's good for that, you know, that period of time for which you're considering uh, expending money on the drainage system, but it is not a benefits determination. And so it does not stand the test of time and then it may need to be redone and redone and redone. So my, my opinion, personal opinion, not legal opinion is that it's perfectly competent. My personal opinion is if you're gonna spend the money on that, you might as well spend the money on viewers and do a redetermination of benefits. Redetermination of benefits is gonna take you a little longer, but it's gonna give you, I think, a, a more enduring product um, that can be used going forward. Um, and it, it, I think they are comparable in the way that they distribute um, ultimate costs, um, at least in the, in the models that were run in the development of the legislation. Um, so, but I did not wanna leave that off the table. Somebody listening out in the audience will yell at me for not bringing it up. So I, I feel compelled to bring it up. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to make a comment. Mr. And go eating uh, one bite at a time. Um, obviously, we, we, we want to scale back this cost. I mean, we want to get this cost less, and we also want to have a maintenance program going forward. But in terms of the project itself, I mean, I, I guess I would hate to see us do that over you know, five, six years. Um, well, I mean, what's the benefit of that? Because a homeowner or a, a, a farmer or a landowner you know, to their assessment comes that they get years to pay that off anyhow. So, I mean, it's like um, the only reason to do it uh, over a period of time is hoping that the costs, the current high costs that we're in now would go down. Uh, but otherwise, if we can scale back the size of the project in terms of you know, not being a million and a half or, you know, being under a million or whatever it is, um, would it be better to do that? And, and then Again, they get to pay it off over time. Who's saying to do the whole thing? 
Well, there's, yep. there's some scale down, right? Let's and you right. could let to mobilization yeah. and those types of things in the order. Mm -hmm. So there's benefits to doing it at, at one time, definitely. Mm -hmm. But I think that's where we need to go back and with your direction, then look at, I think, and as John said, what are those critical things that we should do? There are some inlets definitely that need to be, and there's some culverts that need to be replaced and there's some grading in that bottom that has, mm -hmm. it's just off, it's wrong. And so what are those? And if they have that direction now versus we fix everything, if some of those culverts when they inspect them are okay, that don't need to be replaced, maybe just rip wrap or something. And if you give them direction of getting the trees out of there, I mean, there's some areas you don't have a buffer because it's tree right down into the ditch. Um, those types of things, they could come back with probably a little lower scale and then that's going to take some time. And like John said, the redetermined benefits are going to get some time. Yeah. So it's not like you're going out for bids tomorrow on this project. Right. It's a year out, maybe. I think one in two years. Yeah. Redetermined yeah. benefits a year. year so later. you'll see what's going to happen to prices then as well. So I, I agree with you, John. I, there's benefits to doing a larger project from a mobilization, but then you'd have to work that well with the property owners as well. What does that look like? Well, if you did a bunch of little ones and people never know what their cost is going to be, what their share is going to be, right? And it'd be a lot more. What we could do is we could work, start working on a repair report if you appoint us to do a repair report. And then you start we start bringing that those information back. That would mean we'd have to survey the system. We'd have a, a full, full, complete description of what's happening out there, what kind of condition it's at. And then you can um, split up that repair on the items that are the most critical to do first to prioritize your repair. But uh, we would need to pull survey information. We need to survey the system, take soil samples and things like that to put a full repair report together. And then you could choose from there what you chose to do. And that could be done at the same time that after you're, if you're going to do a redetermination of benefits as the viewers are putting their information together. So those two processes could go on at the same time instead of waiting till one's done to go on to the other one, save some time. But yes. Mr. Beard, you wanted to say something. Uh, yeah, I was um, looking, waiting to see what we were going to be doing and what our requirements here are today. Um, I did look at the agenda and it, there is no call to action uh, for this meeting today. It was basically the public hearing and receive information. So I answered my own question while I was sitting here listening to the discussion. Um, but I guess they, we do owe it to staff to give them direction on what to pair and bring back action items if we want action uh, over the next couple of weeks. So, um, Mr. Chairman, should we give that direction right now or let it simmer for a couple of weeks and, and, and ask more questions or receive some more input? Or do you want, do you want an action item now or what are we expecting? I think we should give them general yeah, direction should, today. Yes. Uh, we, we, I don't think we're going to know more in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, go ahead. I, I, if I were the wizard, my direction would be, I really think we need to start the redetermination of benefits because that's going to take a year. That's going to take time. Um, and whatever we need to do. What was that? Um, do you have, uh, with that recommendation, are you looking for a redetermination on both ditches? Yes. Oh, for sure. I think it's so important. What we learned about the outlet in ditch three is really important. That's that's part of the reason why redetermination is so important now. That's a long process. And I think my, my um, suggestion for direction would be that that's the highest priority. Number two is, I do think we've heard from some landowners here today and, and the other night and from us about the cost that, yeah, we should go forward with a repair report um, so that we really can prioritize. And we may be prioritizing, I kind of feel like if I were, um, Daryl, I'd be a little bit like, that's kind of what we did with number one, two, and three is we did do some priorities. So I, I understand that. I want to give you that. Uh, but but we are concerned about costs. So so I think we want you to go back and, and do a little bit more research on that. And then um, I really had a number three. Oh, number three is I, I know that some of this is the long haul, but I think we we want staff to come forward with the proposed maintenance, long-term maintenance, what's going to be our program here. Mm -hmm. um, because some of that will start in some areas of the ditch already. I mean, it's, it's not like we're going to wait two or three years when we get done with this project and then start it. Once we establish that program in many areas, it can be started right away. So I, I kind of see it as a three-part, the redetermination of benefits, 
the repair report so we can get a little more detailed, and then three, the proposed um, ongoing program, which is going to affect landowners. I mean, they, they have to pay for it. So, so we're going to need some more input uh, from them on that too. I think John has his hand up. Yeah. Well, I want to add one more thing, and this is just a reality of experience. If you were to do the whole thing at once, and when I say the whole thing, some option that is more than just a, a phased approach to addressing things in a prioritized way, it is no better time to borrow money than right now. You will likely not see lower interest rates on bonds issued for this type of project um, than you're, we're seeing right now or probably over the next year. Um, and the projections are that those are only going to go up. So if one of the considerations for the benefit of the landowners is <laughs> can we finance it and what's the best options for financing it? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and again, my, my next real life experience is I've never seen the cost of these things really go down over time. So um, it, it may be that that may drop some of your decision, but I, I can't disagree with the discussion about redetermination of benefits, especially if it is the board's determination that um, they're currently not distributed properly, then you absolutely should start there. Uh, well, I'm sure Mayor has a question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, it related to uh, Commissioner Brecky's uh, comments on Ditch 3 and Ditch 10. Uh, I, I agree. I, I, I don't know how Ditch 3 functions without a Ditch 10. And there's some benefit at some level uh, to, the, to the Ditch 10 repairs, at least if it's downstream of the junction of the, three, of the two ditches. Uh, so I think a determination on Ditch 3 to that extent um, makes a lot of sense too. Uh, the other one might be a little tongue in cheek. We've got a whole bunch of ARP money coming. Is there any way we can link uh, COVID-19 to these ditches filling in or these bushes and growing? <laughs> because infrastructure, especially stormwater, seems to be one that the federal government uh, is interested in letting us spend money on. We can't do roads and bridges, but apparently if water is involved, uh, ARP money might be, uh, uh, might be susceptible to that use. Maybe that's not so tongue in cheek. Maybe that's a serious question. Uh, Commissioner Beard, if I may, in the, legis or in the legislation stormwater specifically mentioned, and we have reached out to a couple of counties that we're working on improvements on to talk about the funding of uh, retention basins or stormwater basins as part of their ditch improvements and seeking funding for those through those funds. So yes, they are eligible. Stormwater is eligible. This is your rural stormwater system is what this is. So that's a different group, a different discussion, but the way we read it and the way we've had discussions with consultants is yes, stormwater is eligible for those projects. So potentially like the uh, public road crossings or something like that would be. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, they might fall into that. Well, I'm gonna to suggest here at this point that the staff has received enough direction from us. Especially uh, with Commissioner Brecky's Comments. I think that was a good roadmap. I think I'm seeing nodding of the heads here. Yes, question? with yeah. Recky's um, uh, recommendations. Was so it's the right? redetermination of the benefits. It's to go back and prioritize the project and look if there's ways to reduce or does every culvert need to be replaced. And then it's to come back with some type of maintenance plan for this ditch. And then how would that impact even sooner than later some of the areas that don't need to repair but should begin to fall into the maintenance plan, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah, I think Cindy needs to add. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, again, rather than itemizing you know, which culverts, again, the ordering of a of repair report. And I will ask John, um, our attorney here, if whether or not that needs to be within the resolution or if they can make that determination now here at this meeting, can they go ahead and order that repair report or shall I come bring back um, and have that part of the resolution and the redetermined redetermination of benefits for both ditches three and 10, according to 103 F.351. Um, and then again, I will bring back, we will bring back the schedule of what the maintenance would look like and what the, uh, the annual spraying or semi-annual or, 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 or every three years, whatever that is, if we do components or whatever the situation is, or if we do the whole ditch like once every two or three years. Uh, we do know that SWCD, I have heard back from uh, the director there, he, they do have a sprayer and a mower as well. 
and we use that as a consideration when going off of bids for that type of project. But uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Cole, do I need to add order of a repair report within the resolution, or is that something they could order without having it as an agenda item? I think for clarity in the drainage system record, I would proceed, prefer to see that in a resolution, and you're proceeding concurrently under 351, 103E351 for the redetermination of benefits, and also under 103E715 for the appointment of an engineer to prepare an engineer's report um, in, a, in a formal repair proceeding. Um, and so you've had the hearing now on whether to appoint the engineer. You basically asked the engineer to give you this uh, uh, condition report or inspection report on steroids. Um, you went a little further and gave you some repair options, but now you're actually appointing the engineer to prepare the repair report. Again, long-winded answer to a shorter question. I would prefer to see both in a resolution and I'm happy to assist you in preparing that. Uh, Mr. Cole, we'll be con in contact with you to get that resolution and uh, drafted and ready for board action. Thank you. Okay, well, that's for a future meeting, obviously. And did you have a- Yeah, Mr. Comment? Chair, I know the public hearing's closed, but I think we have one member of the public who had one more thing to say, if you would entertain him. All right. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to play the devil's advocate with you for a minute. <laughs> Maybe not. Oh, yeah, it's, not, it's your discretion. <laughs> that was a- That was a joke. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to play the devil's advocate for a minute. You talked about maybe doing this in in stages. No, I suggested that we scale down and do it all at once. Oh, okay. I think he's yeah. He wants it all at once. I think it was one of them. One of them characters. But, well, I guess I'll, 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 I'll. I think all at once too. I, yeah. and then, okay. From this, yeah. But I guess my point I was going to make is, uh, okay, if you did it in stages, somebody on the lower end, they gets the benefit of some help right away, and if somebody on the upper end, how long do they wait? Yeah, that, that's my only point. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we're Thanks on the same, same page. <laughs> All right. That's uh, enough information for today. Um, we need a motion to adjourn? Go. Yes, we do. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any more discussion? Wait one second. That was Jim Jurison. Okay. Uh, <laughs> JJ, would you call the roll? Thanks. Commissioner Weckman Brackett? Aye. Commissioner Wolf? Aye. Commissioner Beard? Aye. Commissioner Beer? Aye. Commissioner Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you, everybody.